Uh, we're in chapter 31 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, which, which is going to deal specifically with um, councils and synods. Uh, and so just a, a, a brief overview again, what the concern here is, is with the overarching structure of, of the church. If you recall, I mentioned that the Westminster Confession was designed for uh, the church. It was designed to be a structure, uh, a document of not only confessing a, a, a faith that we can, we can be united in, it could also institute a form of government, a form of structure. That was the goal of the nonconformists who had gained power in Parliament in the 1600s. It was, uh, they really wanted to take advantage of that and radically change the Church of England so it wouldn't look so Catholic and would look more Presbyterian. That was, that was their goal. Uh, of course, they failed at that. But uh, it, uh, the Westminster Confession uh, took a stronghold because it was so... It was backed and supported by so many nonconformists, so many Presbyterians. It, it did become the cornerstone document of the Church of Scotland, uh, which, of course, we as Presbyterians are direct descendants of. So all that, again, is to say this is, this is going to be their point of conversation, um, and they're going to describe what it is that these synods and councils are for. So we'll just begin with uh, the first article here. For the better government and further edification of the church... There ought to be such assemblies as are commonly called synods or councils. Now, there's this notion that comes straight from Scripture. Here they, they reference to Acts, and this is going to be the probably the cornerstone text of this, but there are others as well in, in the New Testament. Uh, in Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 2, we see this. Uh, Some men came from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. So this is an, that section is an introduction. The, uh, all of Acts chapter 15 is what's called the Council of Jerusalem. And this is where the, and we see here that during the introduction of that, the, the concern is the edification of the church. Uh, and if you know what's going on in, in the in first century church, um, there, you know, some men, verse 1 in Judea, began teaching that unless you be circumcised according to them, you cannot be saved. So these were, these were a group of, of Christians who come from the, you know, they were Jewish Christians, and they were adamant that in order to be a Christian, you had to first become a Jew. That's essentially what they're saying. You had to be circumcised in order to be saved. They were making that logical connection. And it became a works righteousness uh, religion. And of course, we know what Paul says, that that is not the case. If you go through and read many of his letters, the Apostle Peter as well. And so we see here that the, there's a debate. And in verse 2, we see what happens. Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with these people. So notice that the, the council doesn't, isn't called immediately. It's called to address the situation uh, in this case. And so it, it, it gathers to address the, the, the dissension between Paul and Barnabas and these men from Judea. Uh, we don't know who they are, Judaizers of some sort. And so the, the others, you know, the brethren, determined that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. So notice there's already within the mindset of the early church a hierarchy, a structure of some sort. You, you have here... I'll, we'll start sort of with the, we have these men of Judea and Paul and Barnabas. Okay, these are the, these are the I would say the, the troops on the ground, if you will. These are the preachers. These are the guys who are going out there teaching these messages. Of course, the men of Judea are teaching a, a false doctrine, or at least they're teaching error. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily that they, they're, just, they're just erroneous. You don't have to be circumcised to be, uh, to be saved. That was, that's Paul's point. So these, these two doctrines are, are, seem to be an error, uh, or at least in, in opposition to each other. Then there seems to be a, another group called the Brethren. My guess is these are all part of the same. These are all clergy, is what we would, we would call them. Um, you know, these are, you know, men of Judea, Paul and Barnabas, uh, maybe John, uh, maybe Mark, maybe Luke, you know, other folks who, who you know, we would recognize as, uh, as fellow preachers, perhaps even some deacons in there. Um, and so they, these brethren, suggest that the men of Judea and Paul and Barnabas go before the apostles and the elders. 
And so we see there, there seems to be some sort of a, a structure to, to the way the, the church is, is already in the first century. The apostles and the elders who are in Jerusalem, these are the, and of course, he, we're talking about the 12 original ones, although I guess by now, who was dead? One of the early ones died pretty soon. Um, so, so we've got the apostles, the ones who were with Jesus, and the elders of the church who are in Jerusalem. They are going to be making a decision and, and hearing the debates between Paul and uh, these others. And of course, you just read chapter 15, you'll see that that's, that's exactly what, what happens. Um, and and this, is, this chapter here is the cornerstone text for establishing this form of government. Uh, for the church. And I just wanted to draw it up here so you can see it. Any questions on that as we move on to the next article? Yeah, I think it was uh, John's brother, James, was killed. That's it, James. Yep. Killed. Yep. Yeah, as I knew one of them died pretty early. Yeah. yeah. And then God killed Herod in the very spectacular. That was, yeah. <laughs> All right, then we'll uh, move on to the second article. As magistrates may lawfully call a synod of ministers and other fit persons to consult and advise with about matters of religion, so if magistrates be open enemies to the church, the ministers of Christ of themselves by virtue of their office, or they with other fit persons upon delegation from their churches, may meet together in such assemblies. So let me be a little bit transparent and say the Westminster Divines have put this in here essentially to give their gathering credence and to give their assembly um, some sort of, of, of authority there. Um, if you remember when we talked about of civil magistrates, which I think was chapter 27, somewhere around back there, um, the, one of the things that they said you, the magistrate could do is call an assembly together in order to have, you know, have these debates and conversations. And of course, we saw that in church history. Um, one of the early councils, if, uh, I think it was the, the, the Council of Ephesus, and then there was, um, you know, back then there was the debate over who is, who is Mary? Is she the uh, God-bearer? The, the, the Theotokos or the Christ bear, the Christotokos. Well, the, the, the church called that us along with the, um, it was the Byzantine Empire. So, you know, this, it was a political, uh, also a political and religious conversation that was going on. So, so there are times when the magistrate, the government, can ask for the ministers of the church to gather together and have conversation and say, okay, there's clearly some dissension, some debate here. Y'all need to figure it out. The state has that uh, authority and ability to tell the church, y'all should get together and, and have a conversation. Uh, so it, in the Old Testament, we see that happening a lot. Second Chronicles chapter 19, verse 8. Uh, in Jerusalem, also Jehoshaphat appointed some of the Levites. So here we have Jehoshaphat. He's the, the, the king. He appointed some of the Levites and priests and some of the heads of the fathers, households of Israel, for the judgment of the Lord and to judge disputes among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So here we have Jehoshaphat, the king. He's appointing Levites uh, and priests and essentially the, the elders, the noblemen of Israel. And he's gathering them together as a council of sorts in order to judge disputes among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Uh, and then again, in Proverbs, Solomon talks about in 11 verse 14, where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselor, counselors, there is victory. So there's this, there's this notion that when we have a group of people gathering together and, and debating and having these conversations, there is more wisdom present there than if it were just a sole individual making decisions on behalf of the church. That's essentially what Solomon is, is getting at. And again, we see that present. Uh, Moses does something similar by pointing to 70 elders and there are other examples in the Old Testament, but this is just one I wanted to highlight here, that the magistrate may lawfully call a synod of ministers. Now, the concern that the Westminster Divines have isn't really so much with that first sentence, it's with this second sentence. If the magistrates be open enemies to the church, the ministers of Christ themselves may meet together in such assemblies. So if, if the state is an open enemy of God, well, an, an open enemy of the church, they're never going to want the church to come together and, and have a council and, and you know, resolve their differences and, and establish their, their statements of faith or whatever they need to do. Because the magistrate doesn't care. The, the state doesn't care about God, doesn't care about Christ. And so in light of that, 
here, the Westminster Divines, and this is where I think they, that they are, they're giving their own uh, uh, assembly credence because they recognize that right now in, you know, whatever, 1643, they have the power, but that might not always be the case. And as history shows us, it wasn't the case. Um, and so the, if the state is an open enemy of God, the ministers themselves may, can, must gather together. And again, they point to Acts chapter 15 for that. Jumping down again, that same chapter, this time to verses four through six. So when they arrived at Jerusalem, this is uh, talking about Paul and Barnabas. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. So notice here again, this is Acts chapter 15. The, the Sanhedrin, which is the political leadership of Jerusalem, never called this meeting together. The state did not call the elders to come and, lead, and make this decision regarding the Gentiles being converted to Christianity. This was solely an act of the church. It was an internal plea, a recognizing that there's a conflict here and we need to resolve this conflict. And we see that happening here uh, with, with this action on behalf of the, of the church. Again, not something that the state called. Because at that time, the state, Jerusalem, was not a friend of the church. In fact, the church, the, the, Jerusalem was an enemy of the church at the time. So that's that second article. Any questions on that one? Yeah, what are your thoughts on verse 5, but some of the believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees? Yes. Yeah. So my translation says, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed, and I'm using the NASB. The way I understand that is these were Pharisees and we know that they exist. You know, Nicodemus, Joseph, Arimathea, you know, these were Paul. (laughs) These were Pharisees who came to believe in Christ. Um, but as you know, how, how hard it is for people to give up their traditions. <laughs> that's the one, I read that, I think, in the book of Galatia. Yes. Galatia, yep. Because that's essentially why Paul wrote Galatians. Was yeah. To counteract this belief right here. Yeah. So I would, it, it could be there was a, like a, a, a double agent within the Pharisees maybe trying to infiltrate. That could be the case. But I when I when I read the NASB and the way they translate the, the Greek into English, in my mind, what I'm hearing is these are people who were once or, or are Pharisees, but came to believe in Christ. That's interesting that my, I use the Christian standard, and it's, it's radically different. Mine would lead yeah. to believe that these are actual, yours is past tense. Yeah, yours this is act, yeah. Mine's an active. Yeah. That's, that's, I'm looking up, I'm, I'm looking up the Greek word. Yeah, so yeah. I just want to stay, I'm curious. Yeah. Any other questions on that article? All right, we're moving along quickly on this one. It's a short, short section here. All right, Article 3. This is, this is as you can tell, it's the, the longest section here. This is going to be the crux of their, uh, of their argument. This is the duties defined, uh, what these councils and synods can and cannot do. It belongs to synods and councils, ministerially, to determine controversies of faith and cases of conscience, to set down rules and directions for the better ordering of the public worship of God, and government of his church, to receive complaints in such cases of maladministration, and authoritatively to determine the same, which decrees and determinations, if consonant to the word of God, are to to be received with reverence and submission, not only for their agreement with the word, but also for the power whereby they are made, as being an ordinance of God appointed thereunto in his word. So here we see what the role of these various councils are. Now let me step back and just say, I know we've got a plethora of, of denominations here. Um, I'm, I'm going to be working with what we call the Presbyterian system, our, our polity. Uh, at the top we have what we call GA, which is the General Assembly, and that, that meets annually. Beneath them are the synods, which are that they make up different states. So for instance, our synod that we're in is the Synod of Mid-Atlantic, which stretches from, is it South Carolina to Maryland? Do you know, is that right? And so pretty much all those states, South Carolina to Maryland, 
make up the synod of the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, within these synods, we have what are called presbyteries. And each presbytery is essentially the regional gathering of, of, the, of the Presbyterian churches. So, for instance, we are in Presbytery of the Peaks. We're pretty much central Virginia. Um, I think we go, as, we go just south of Stanton. Stanton's in a different presbytery. Uh, Farmville, maybe just a little past Farmville. Uh, the whole North Carolina border from Clarksville to around Floyd and then up to the Blue Ridge following it. So, so that's where we are. That's our presbytery, our region. And the state of Virginia, I think, has five different presbyteries within the PCUSA. Um, and then under the presbyteries are actually the sessions. So we have four layers of councils within, within our uh, church. It's probably not too dissimilar from the, the Catholic or from the Episcopal Church. The session is each congregation. So each congregation has a session, and each congregation is a part of the presbytery, and each presbytery is part of the synod, and each synod is falls under the, the guidance. Yeah. So so that's the, the general structure that that I'm working with. Um, that's because that's just what, what I'm familiar with. And, and it's very similar to what the uh, the, these Presbyterians would have done as well. Uh, they would have considered the Westminster Assembly their general assembly. So when these folks gathered in 16-whatever, they were making decisions at this level, and then it would impact each of the, the various... Now, I can't tell you how they were structured. So, then the Presbyterian then, so back then, when they had the Westminster meeting, mm -hmm. they already had the synodized... Presbyteries and the sessions already set up? Essentially. Uh, what, what I can't say for sure because I haven't researched it, but all the representatives who came to GA, 200 and some odd number of them, were some of them were noblemen. So these were aristocrats who were believers. Some of them were doctors of the faith. So these were professors at, uh, at seminaries or, 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 you know, really big name uh, pastors uh, like... Uh, John Knox wasn't there, but someone like a John Knox would have been there. Um, and then, uh, then there would have just been other pastors and even lay leaders there who would have been present. So I don't know what the structure of the churches looked like, but there were certainly different churches and different regions of, of the UK represented here at this assembly. So Methodists and Lutherans have the same type of structure. I think they have something similar, so different words. Involved. Yeah, you Baptists, and we're gonna we're we're gonna talk about that because because yeah, this this really are, particular right? section actually is geared not not against the Catholic Church or the Episcopal or the Anglican Church. This section is actually geared against the Anabaptists, who who don't who say there is no structure that that each church is its own autonomous yeah, uh, entity, and yeah. and so this section is actually attacking that theology more so than the Catholic one. Yeah, so the way that the Presbyterian works, it is an elected representative. Now, that's not the case with the Catholic or even with the Episcopal system because you have cardinals and bishops who, and those people are installed into those positions. And in our system, you, you elect people to go. Um, so each, each individual session, each congregation will send one representative to the Presbytery meeting. And then, in addition to the pastor, if they have a pastor, well, we'll uh, and then, yep, and then each presbytery will send a number of commissioners to either the synod or, or the general assembly. Synods don't always they do things, but if you're making really big decisions, each presbytery will send a number of commissioners, is what we call them, but they're representatives to to general assembly. So yeah, so that's how that that structure would work. So the again the purpose of and the reason why I list this structure is because I think this structure, as it is, the structure is fine, but what we're doing is an error because we're not following the biblical model that is laid out here with us. So that's why I'm focusing only on Presbyterians because I can only speak for Presbyterians, but unfortunately we're going to take a jab at Baptist too while we're here. <laughs> good, good. All right, so this, did, I'm sorry, did you have a question? They have a term of office, so they just go to the 
one gathering and then and then they're done. Yeah. I mean, I, they might have other responsibilities, but no, there's not a, a term limit. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We don't have anything like that. Yeah. All right. So the point of this section here is to list a number of, let me see what do I have here, five different points of, of what the duties are of this, of the council. So it belongs to the councils to do these things. The first one is to determine controversies of faith and cases of conscience. So here's, this is, and again, it's important that they start with this one. This is, this is the biblical model. This is the, the whole reason why these councils and synods exist. And it's this very first sentence, to determine controversies of faith. So if there's a, a controversy within faith, and I actually love this word controversy. I just, I just learned this uh, in, in some of my study today. This word controversy, oh, I can't spell it. No, I learned about this yesterday. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, I learned. See, I don't need. So, this this word is a Latin word, and I and I love it. So you have the word contro, which you know the word contra against. Uh huh. Um, and then you have this word here, which is a Latin word versus, which is really the word to turn. So when you, when you look at the word controversy, you know, what we think of, we think of something that, you know, oh, well, someone's being, it, it, it's, uh, well, tell me, what do you think when you hear the word controversy? What comes to your mind? Conflict. Conflict. You probably think of, of someone trying to, uh, to, to maybe rise up or, or rally, you know, whatever it is trying to do. The, the actual language of this word controversy means you have someone who has turned against the whatever, whether it's the rule of law, the doctrine, whatever it is. In theology, in this case, a, th a controversy of faith is someone who, so we're, we're talking about believers, and I'm going to write about this in a, an upcoming article at the link. Um, you have someone who, who knows what the faith is and has turned against it. So that's what a controversy of faith is. So it's not just someone, it's not just conflict. We all have conflicts. We all have, we all debate. We all, you know, we all have, whether I want Fruit Loops or you want Cheerios, we don't need to get into a conflict or a controversy over those things, but we're going to, we're going to, we might debate them. I might. How, now, how close is that to being apostate? And that's my point, right? is, is a person who is controversial, again, isn't someone who is, um, who's trying to go against the grain or someone who, who you might disagree with. No, a controversial person, theologically speaking, is an apostate, okay. someone who has turned from the doctrines and systems of faithfulness. Uh, and we see that councils have to be called, sometimes in this case, have to be called in order to address these controversies. So either, as we talked about with the discipline, either ask that person or that church to repent, recognize the, 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 you know, the, the error and return to fellowship or to address the person and, and say, you know, like for instance, uh, a one particular council, I think it was the, the council of uh, Nicaea, maybe it was 320 something, one, one of those early ones, they actually looked at a man named Origen, who was a, a very early church father, and they said, no, not Origen, um, Nestorius, that's it is. And they said, Nestorius, you are a heretic. You, we're, we're turning our backing. So the, or the early church said Nestorius was being controversial in faith, turning against faith, and they labeled him a heretic and kicked him out of the church. As it so stands, Nestorius becomes the patron saint of the church in like Syria and the, the Middle East there. So you'll find a lot of Nestorian Christians out there. Anyways, that's a random aside. Let me point you back again to the scripture because, I, I, again, I want to make the point here. The, the, the first duty defined is to determine controversies of faith and cases of conscience. Uh, and again, only the Bible can, can bind our conscience. We talked about that. We talked about Christian liberty. But you know that we get into debates over what, what defines conscience then. Well, we have to go to the Bible in order to define that. And so sometimes we have to go all the way up to the top to the council to define, here's the, the, the conscience. And I'm just going to point again to Acts chapter 15. I'm not going to read verses 4 through 6 again, but that's, where, that's the, the quotation I have here. Again, the controversy of faith is you have these men of Judea, or as Paul labels them, the Judaizers, who are, who are proclaiming, who are teaching, you have to be circumcised in order to be a Christian. Or another way to put it, you have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. 
And, and, that, and Paul says, no, that's works righteousness. That was the downfall of the Jews because they based so much weight in the works, in the good works that they were doing. And, you know, Paul will go on in Philippians to say, I was the, the, the Pharisee of Pharisees. I was a, a Hebrew of Hebrews is actually what he says. And he says, I count it all as rubbish. It's garbage. There was nothing before God uh, because those works don't matter. And, and that's the controversy here. These controversial people, these controversial teachers, the ones who are turning against the, the doctrine of faith, which is handed down by, by Christ through the apostles, those people are turning against it. And now the council has to call them together and say, we need to rectify this. You, we, we either say it's free grace or it's, you know, it's sovereign grace. You don't, you can do, there's no works necessary. Or we say you have to do works. That's what the council has to decide. And the council then goes through and they listen to Paul and they listen to, uh, uh, yeah, they listen to Barnabas. They listen to all these folks who are expositing the scriptures and they're, they're showing how Jesus himself said that this word is supposed to go out to the Gentiles, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, again, the, 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 con the case of conscience in this particular instance in Acts chapter 15 is regarding circumcision. Now, Paul will go on to say, I think it's in maybe it's 1 Corinthians or maybe it's Galatians, one of the other letters. He, he goes and talks about, it doesn't matter if you're going to celebrate these certain feast days. You know, he's, he says that, what, what is it, what's, you know, what's, uh, I think it is Corinthians, where he talks about whether you eat meat that was sacrificed to the idols or not. Because again, in, in that world, if you went to the marketplace to go buy your steak, it could have been very likely that that steak was sacrificed to Zeus or some other god you may or may not know that, depending on what city you're in. And so as a Christian, the question is, can I eat, can I buy that steak and take it home and cook it for my family? Well, Paul goes on and answers that question. The same thing, he then looks at the Jews and says, you know, they, who want to celebrate their, their Sabbaths, their feast days, in, you know, Hanukkah, Yom Kippur, um, you know, the ones that you, if you have any Jewish friends. And he looks at them and says, it says to both the Jews and the Gentiles, look, the works don't matter. If, if you're scandalized by eating meat sacrificed to God, don't eat meat sacrificed to God. If you know that it doesn't actually matter because it's, it's just a work and you're saved by faith, eat the meat. Same thing to the Jews. If you know that, if, if you think that you're celebrating these days to honor God and, and to celebrate Jesus, you're doing it in error. But if you recognize that these feast days pointed to Jesus and you are still honoring that, then that seems to be okay, Paul says. Paul allows for conscience, freedom of conscience in those, in those situations. In this case here, the conscience is, do you have to be circumcised or not? Do you have to become a Jew or not? And then that matter of conscience, that's a lot bigger than just choosing Cheerios or Fruit Loops. No, no, this is, if you have to be circumcised, then what about baptism? Because Jesus says, go and baptize. If, if Jesus didn't say go and circumcise, and so now we have a debate. Now we have a hot topic issue. And this is why the council is called to determine controversies of faith and cases of conscience. So that's the, the first one. And I would dare say the primary reason why uh, an assembly, uh, especially an assembly, at the national or international level would be would be called. Um, and you can still have, I mean, salvation is the number one controversy ever since Genesis 3. Yeah. And, and people debate and argue how you're made right before God mm -hmm. to this day all across the world. Yep. Because people will tell you you have to obey the law, you mm -hmm. have to, like they're saying, you have to be circumcised and according to the customs of Moses, that was a hot debate. It's yeah. always hot. That and then the second biggest one would be what is sin? Mm -hmm. What defi Our culture tells you that certain certain lifestyles are okay and God's okay with it. Yeah. And the Word of God says different. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so knowing that the matters of conscience, yeah, yeah, some things are okay, but or some things can be up for debate. But there are some things that are very clearly established in Scripture okay. by God's Word. That's not. It's not up for debate. Yeah. It's not okay. So, yeah, and that's sometimes why the councils need to, be, need to assemble. Because, again, in the Westminster divines, in their mind, these assemblies will help 
the, their, the churches that go under them. You know, they'll, they'll establish this, you know, the Westminster Confession of Faith in this instance, and the churches will, will say, ah, okay, that, that's a good way of explaining the scriptures to me. That's a good way of, 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 that enlightens me and shows me where in scripture this is the way I'm supposed to be aligning. As far as the matter of conscience to your fellow believer, uh, Paul would say that don't do anything that causes your weaker brother to stumble. Exactly. And so if yep. you do something that your conscience is good with it, but if she sees you mm-hmm. do it and she stumbles, then you're in sin. Yep. Yeah. 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 But when I, I use the example that Paul gave, I think it was in Galatians there, where, or maybe it's Ephesians, where he says, uh, you know, about eating meat. You know, if if yeah. e- if you if eating meat you know it doesn't mean anything. You can eat meat, but if if your uh, this weaker Christian thinks that you know you're eating meat, you're 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 going to be committing this adult you know this sin. Well, you probably shouldn't eat the hamburger around them. Doesn't mean you can't eat a hamburger, but when you're hanging out with them, you should probably go with the salad. If I found out, <laughs> you, you just, friends, like, we just wouldn't be friends. Yeah. The other, the second thing that I see here that the divines say that another duty that is set for the councils is to set down rules and directions for public worship and government. So here we see again two things about the way the church is to is to run, the way the church is to do what the church does, specifically the the outward, the the how the way other people see the church. Now we in the church know what the church is to do. We're supposed to go make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach them all that God has commanded. Those who are outside the church, what's the first thing they see? I mean, when you invite a visitor to church, what are you inviting them to do? You're inviting them to worship, most often, right? That's that if you're going to invite someone, hey, come to, come to church. When, is, when do you meet? Sunday morning, like every other church in town. And so that's what we're inviting the public to, is to our worship, public worship, and then the government. So the the assemblies set up the rules and directions for these things. And again, pointing to Acts chapter 15, we see in verses 19 and 20, this is near the end of, of the decision and debate there. Uh, Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what has strangled and from blood. And so notice here what, what the... Uh, what that assembly is doing is essentially reminding these Gentiles, because again, these are Gentiles, pagans, coming from a culture that is very, very idolatrous, a culture that is, uh, doesn't know the God of, of the Old Testament, and who is very used to and familiar with things like uh, sacrifices to idols uh, and, and other forms of idolatry, which again, if you were a Jew, you would know, well, we would never do that. It, it, you know, if you're a Jew becoming a Christian, there is, there, there's connectivity. There's a, there's a logical progression to that. But if you're a Gentile becoming a Christian, it's a radically different change. You, you've got a plethora of gods that you can sacrifice to. And if you sacrifice good enough, they'll, they'll do whatever you want. To now you've got one God who, who is saved by faith alone, and you have to submit and trust in this man named Jesus who, who not only you know, walked on this earth, but actually died. Why would I, you know, Hercules never died, or you know, Zeus never died. Why, why would I want to worship this guy, Jesus, who died and then resurrected again? And so you have to imagine, think about the, the world, put yourself in the, in the shoes of a first century pagan. And so the, the, the assembly here says, okay, there, we don't need to trouble them, meaning we don't need to tell them they need to become Jews in order to become a Christian. They've already converted to this faith, okay? In light of that conversion, in light of that saving gift, you know, we write to them, okay, well, abstain then from things contaminated by idols, from fornication, from things that are strangled and from blood. You know, the things that are very clearly connected to the temple worship, or excuse me, well, the, the pagan worship. You should probably stay away from those things, new Christian. You should probably stay away from those things uh, you know, when, when you come into the faith. And again, that's setting down a rule and a direction for public worship and for government. When you come to church and you're going to worship with your other Christians, whether they're, they were Jewish or not, you should probably you know, not bring your meat, that you, you know, your, your roast beef sandwich that you got from sacrificing over there. At, you know, you know, things like that. There's this notion that setting down the, the rules uh, for, and directions for public worship and for government. And of course, for us, that, that expands because we don't 
well, maybe we do live in a pagan nation, but we don't live in that type of pagan nation. And, and so for us, when we come and gather together, it is our church. In our instance, it's the sessions. And the Baptists, I guess it's your deacons, your board of deacons. And what's at the Episcopal church? What do you call your, your local, your, your leaders? The vestry. the vestry, yeah. So, so you know, you've got, these are the folks who, who determine at the local level what, what are the rules and directions for your public worship and for, and for your government. What, what, what rules do you, do you live by within that church? Any questions on that one? We'll move to the third point. All right, the third duty that's defined is to receive complaints in cases of maladministration. So again, we have to recognize that we are humans. The Westminster Divines recognized that we were humans. Jesus knew that we were humans and set up, again, that system of forgiveness. There's a reason why chapter uh, 30, on, well, I guess 29, well, I guess it is 30, yeah, on, on forgiveness, on discipline, comes before the synods and councils. Because in order to understand and, and, and enact church discipline, sometimes you have to have a hierarchy to appeal to. Because if it's the pastor who is in error, well, who, who are you going to go to? You, you, it's going to be hard to go to him, especially if that pastor is, you know, unrepentant and is still leading this church and won't, and won't step down. Well, what, what recourse, what action do, does the church have? And if, there, if there's no hierarchy, if there's no structure, if there's no one to point to, then that pastor will just do it. And, and unfortunately, that's the problem of Baptist churches. <laughs> but, but I know Scott could speak. I mean, you, you, get, you get one pastor, you get a guy up there, whether he's energetic, charismatic, he, he's this, it's, a, it's a cult of personality, and then suddenly he, he, he goes in air. He, he starts sleeping around with you know, his secretary or, or playing around you know, with the, the wife of the pianist, or I don't know who it is. You know, you know, he's doing things that he shouldn't be doing. Well, I don't know. Who, who do you go to if there's Nobody. Nobody. And, and that causes a split in the church. It'll split your church. It'll I mean, split your church. I served, my first church I served on was associate pastor uh, way back, gosh, 20 years ago now. Uh, our organist who grew up in the church uh, had an affair. Mm. And she was married to a man that was very prominent in Franklin County. And half the church sided with her. Mm hmm I mean, think about that. And the pastor, the pastor tried to do the right thing by removing her because she was up front on Sunday yeah. morning, but there was nothing we could appeal to. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah, my point. yeah. There was no Franklin County uh, Baptist Board of whatever yeah. we could go to take our case to. Yeah. It was handled in-house, and it was, it was ugly and yeah. devastating yeah. and everything. And, and that's what the, the, the Westminster Divines saw. Remember, this is written in 1646, 1647, this is 100 years plus after the Reformation started in 1517. And so right within, you know, between 1517 and when, Luke, when Calvin dies in 1566, you already see the, the, the three groups. You have the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Catholic Church, the Reformed Protestant Church, which, you know, the Lutherans, Calvinists, and then you have the Anabaptist Church, or, or what was called the that was called the Radical Reformation, and, and and from them they you know they they were the ones who stressed adult baptism only, no no infant baptism. They were the ones who were stressing this you know there doesn't need to be a heart because of course and again I give I give them credit the Anabaptists they see what's wrong with Rome, they see the Roman Church, they see how the Pope has all this power, and they see how all these cardinals are just going around selling their bishoprics, selling their birth. You know, there's this thing called simony that came about in the Middle Ages. That was one of the things that, that sparked the Reformation, or one of the many things that led to it. And it, thankfully, that was addressed in the Roman Church, one of the few things. But uh, the, there are things, you know, the, you had these popes and cardinals and bishops who were doing things that were wildly inappropriate, and yet no one would do anything. And so, you know, if you're in the Reformation and you're a radical Anabaptist, you're like, yeah, well, get rid of, get rid of hierarchy. We don't need it. Clearly, it, clearly it, it fosters power and contempt and, and, and greed because we see that in the Roman church. That's what we got. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and so the Westminster Confession is trying to find a middle ground because they recognize, okay, yes, they're, they're, the structures can be sinful because guess what? People are sinners. But we need those structures at the same time in order for cases like this, where we receive complaints 
of maladministration. And one thing they point to, or one thing that I want to point to is Galatians chapter 2, verse 14. Uh, here Paul is talking about this, but when I saw that they were not straightforward, so you know, here we're talking about Peter and Mark and some of others who, who were uh, essentially pandering to the Judaizers. That's his, that's his concern. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, now that was the concern that Paul had. They weren't straightforward about the truth of the gospel. Not, it's not that they were friends with Judaizers. It's not that they were hanging out with them. No, it's that they weren't uh, straightforward about the truth of the gospel. I said to Cephas, as to Peter, in the presence of all, so, you know, in an assembly, Paul confronts Peter, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? And, it's, and this goes on in the conversation that has to happen. And essentially what, what has to happen is this gets brought to the leadership, if I remember correctly. And there's a level of maladministration. Paul recognized that Peter was an error there. And he needed Peter, he wanted Peter to recognize that he had strayed from the gospel message. And he needed those other elders, the, the, the leadership, to help correct Peter. And again, we have those cases. That's why we have this structure, because we don't have Peter. We don't have Paul. I mean, we do. They're written down. But they're not here right now to you know, settle our debates. We have to appeal to Scripture. And so that's why we have these different structures in place because if a if a church if a congregation sees their leader being doing maladministration whatever that may be they need to have the authority the re, the, abil the ability to have recourse and so they have to have someone who's above that pastor who can then say hey you've done wrong let's fix this that's the that's the main or one of the, the third tenant there I would say that too thinking about your Baptist side, every, anybody's side, this is thought occurred to me as you were talking, that your leadership, though, is only as good as their godliness. Yeah. Because yeah. like you said, you can have corruption at the top. That's true. Yeah. I mean, it's only as good as yeah. your... And, and that's why I think the Article 2 exists. You know, if the magistrate doesn't want to call, then the church gets to call. Because if the church, you know, whatever that is, recognizes that their highest office... So I'll just use the Catholic Church as an example. If, if you know, all these clergy or say a bunch of you know, different pastors recognized that the Pope was in error, then they would have had the power to assemble and say, we, you know, he needs to be addressed. This problem needs to be, needs to be uh, addressed. That's what that second article gives the power to the, to the, the assembly, the church, to gather together. So even if it's the, the highest office is an error, well, there's still area of recourse because there's, you know, if you get, if you have, you know, the majority of the, the denomination against that person, then you're either going to split. I mean, essentially it becomes like a church issue, but at least there's an area of recourse. It's not that they can necessarily. So they did that then because Peter was the highest authority at the time, wasn't he? Well, so no, <laughs> I, I don't think Peter, Peter was not a pope. He was not the bishop of Rome. It's certainly not by the time Paul is writing in Galatia. Maybe at some point later he became that, but Galatia, the letter to the Galatians was written in the, the early mid-50s, I think. That was Paul's first letter. Right? I think it was, yeah, I was thinking that maybe early to mid-50s. I can't remember exactly Peter when. He was important. He was important, he absolutely. Was yeah, but he wasn't, he wasn't in charge. Well, I was thinking yeah. what Jesus said on giving him the keys yeah 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 so yeah, that yeah. Well, that's how that's why catholics elevate yeah ele yeah exactly yeah no i i think what it is is just referencing yeah so on peter he's going to go out there and, and do all these what good the things half brother james the pastor of the church in jerusalem at the time yes yep so, so he was pretty well known i mean he was yeah yeah yeah, and that's actually who they appealed to. Yeah. They, they appealed to the apostles. And again, what Paul is, in, in this instance where he confronts Peter, remember, Paul is, I mean, he is an apostle, but he's an outside apostle in the sense that, you know, he's not one of the original 12. He never knew Jesus as he lived on this earth. He, now, he, he knew Jesus as, he, I believe that Paul was there. Like, Paul was Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Christ. absolutely. Yeah. He knew who Christ was. Yeah. But he viewed him as a heretic against Exactly. Him. He viewed him as yeah. a separatist leader, yep. yeah. so to speak. 
Yeah. And so he had to die, but he, yeah. he knew who Christ was. Oh, yeah, yeah. But he didn't know him like Peter knew him or Christ like John knew him. Exactly. Yeah, him. yeah, as a he person. He would know today. He would know him like as, as a Mormon would know Yeah, Jesus, yeah. Right? Yeah. Or a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. And so it, in that instance, I think Paul, recognizing that, you know, he, he is, I mean, he's a, a very good speaker and a verbose, and clearly God used him. Half of the New Testament is his words. Uh, over half the New Testament probably is his words. Um, and so, but Paul recognizes that he doesn't have the authority of the council, of, the, of the, the apostles in that same sense. And so he, in confronting Peter, says, y'all make the decision, essentially. You know, here's the facts of the situation. Peter, you, and he goes, he says, you, the assembly, said it's okay for the Gentiles to not become circumcised. And yet here we have Peter saying against that controversy, he's turned against that truth, that doctrine that needs to be remedied. Thankfully, Peter remedies because we, we, you know, Peter doesn't remain apostate. But in that moment, he had turned from the doctrines of faith, the doctrines of grace. Yeah, yeah. He was, yeah. He, he, he wanted his reputation. He wanted to stay hang out with these maybe influential Judaizers. You know, he, he, he wanted all these, these you know, bad reasons. So those, those I do want to, we're, we're getting close. There's, those are three. I misspoke, not, not five. There's only three. Those are the three duties that are defined by this, um, by this assembly. And this is where coming now, now I'm going to talk to our Presbyterians. So y'all guests can still listen, but this is where I see there's a disconnect in many of our Peace USA churches. I'm going to uh, read to you from a, a, a pastor. Uh, I'm not going to tell you anything about who this person is, but I just want you to read the, this concern that they have. I don't really know what the goal of session meetings should even be. So there are pastors in our denomination who, who think this way. I don't really know what the goal of session meetings should even be. I know sessions oversee the business of the church and ensure the worship is happening in appropriate, accessible ways. That's, that's written in our book of order. So that, that part is correct, that the church, that session oversees the business of the church and ensures that worship is happening. But notice the language there. Oversees the business of the church and ensures worship is happening. Um, this person says that the, the, this person's not sure what topics I should, I should just make decisions on and report said decisions, what should be assigned to a committee, and what deserves the whole session's attention. Listen to the three things that this person doesn't really know what decisions need to be made on. What topics should I just make decisions on and report? What should be assigned to a committee? So what, what I as the pastor have the ability to, to change or do? what the committee has the power ability to do, and what deserves the whole session's attention. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but notice that that is nowhere in Scripture. Nowhere does the Bible say the church is to be run by committees. Nowhere does the Bible say the committee structure is to do the work of the church. This person, the problem that this pastor has isn't so much with these, and, and I don't, again, I don't necessarily have a, my concern isn't with those things. My concern is with this pastor's understanding of what the session, what the council does. Clearly, the Westminster Divines tell us there are three things that the, Westmin, that the, the council does. Determine controversies of faith and cases of conscience. That certainly applies at the highest level, but that also applies within the church. It is the session, in our instance, that, that determines the controversies of faith and the cases of conscience as lo- and making sure that they align with Scripture. It is the session that sets down the rules and directions for public worship and, and, and government and is the session that receives the complaints of maladministration. These are the three things that the session, again, in our instance, these are the three things that our session is given in the Bible and through our Westminster Confession the authority and the power to do. What this person, what this pastor is thinking, and this is, this is I'm going to get my soapbox for a minute. This is, this is unfortunately a, a handover, a holdover from when our denomination and many mainline denominations here in the U.S. took on the corporate model in the early 1900s. So this has been with us for over 100 years or about 100 years. In the early 1920s and the early 1900s, the church began seeing how the cor- corporate world in America worked. 
They saw the businesses, uh, you know, the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts. They saw these folks who are running their companies, their corporations, these industries who are running them successfully, powerfully, making big change. How are they running that? Well, they're running it with their CEOs, with their boards. Now, of course, the, that language might be a little bit different than it was, but those committee structures, Rockefeller had, a, had, a, had authority and he had a committee. And Vanderbilt and all these other folks, Edison, you know, all, the, all these folks, Westinghouse. You think about, think about the time period, 1900. I mean, this is a, this is a, a time of change in America in, within the, the economic and, you know, that, that type of world. The church sees that. And by 1920 and 1930, the Protestant churches, specifically, you know, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, um, maybe some Lutherans, but definitely Presbyterians and Methodists, by the time this time comes around, we have taken on their structure, the corporate structure. And so the session, and this is again where this pastor is concerned, the session then becomes a board of trustees or a board of directors. What's the board of directors going to do? Well, they have to direct and do all these things, or you know, the, the session has to, you know, what decisions do I make as the CEO? I'm going to use that language to make it. So me, pastor, as a, as a CEO, what decisions can I make and report to my board of directors? What should be assigned to a committee for them to, to make a decision on? And what should be brought to the whole board of directors for their, for their look? That's what you do in the corporate model, right? That's what you do in industry. That is not how the church has run for 1,900 years. Robert's rules of order. <laughs> And so the, the, the problem is that we've lost, and by we, I'm talking about our, you know, us here in the PCUSA, and maybe others as well, but I only know our experience. We've lost what the biblical doctrine and mandate is for our sessions, for our, our church leaders, because clearly they exist. In this scheme here, I would say these brethren who saw the debate between the men of Judea and Paul and Barnabas, this is the session, I would, I would dare say. I might be wrong in saying that, it's just an assumption, but I would be willing to say this was the, the, the local leaders. This is the session. And they saw that there was debate and conflict and resolution wasn't happening. And so the session said, y'all need to take it to the apostles and the others. Y'all need to take it to the presbytery, to use our, use our language. The what? They were Southern. Yeah, they were Southern. Y'all. <laughs> Y'all. And so, again, that, that's what the, in my mind, what the session, too, too often we, we, again, we're running like a board of directors. That is not the biblical model. It may have worked in the sense that it was attractive. It, it brought in money. It put butts in pews. It may have done a lot of those things in, you know, between 1930 and 1960. But what have we lost? You know what we've lost? We've lost the biblical understanding of eldership, the biblical understanding of leadership. Our elders, and I'm not talking specifically about our elders, but I'm talking about our elders in Peace USA in general. Our elders view themselves as committee members, as directors. It's hard. And I mean, I, if, if Kevin were here, he'd probably tell you he's chaired the nominations committee several times and others, maybe others you have as well. It's hard to get people to commit to join our session. Why is that? Because it's not a biblical model. People are thinking with a corporate mindset and we've lost what it is to be an elder in a biblical model. And this doctrine the Westminster Confession of Faith, I feel, helps to correct that. And again, it's not something that's unique to us. I think this is, this is a cancer in the Peace USA in general. It says this is something that's affected our whole denomination. I've, granted, I've only known, I've only sat on maybe four or five sessions in my career, but all of them run this way. And all of them can be dysfunctional. All of them struggle. Why is that? I think it's because the model is wrong. We've lost the biblical Perhaps, model. I mean, think about it. All of our conventions have gone away from the Word of God. Mm -hmm. For the most part, all of our, I don't care, go across any type of Baptist, they've all departed from 
scripture, I mean, Southern Baptist especially, mm -hmm. it's more about tradition and, and, and corporatism and culture yeah. and what, what's, you know, what's cu culture defines the Southern Baptist Convention today. Mm -hmm. And I would say it's the same with ours. So yeah. it's, it's and many other denominations, I yeah. would say. All right, let me wrap up because we're very close to finishing. I do want to say one final word on a sentence here in this article. So the Westminster Confession says, which decrees, so the decrees of these councils, which decrees, if consonant with the word, so if, if the councils, whatever they are, if they make a decision and it is consonant, meaning it, it sounds the same, it resonates, it, it essentially repeats what scripture says, if consonant to the word, those decrees are to be received with reverence and submission for the power whereby they are made. So if a council, whatever council it is, so this is where the Westminster Confession is giving the council the authority. They, this is their teeth, if you will. If a council makes a decision and that decision is consonant with the word, meaning it doesn't, it does, it's not dissonant, it doesn't resonate against God's word, but essentially repeats God's word, if they are standing on sound doctrine when they make their decision, then we, as wherever we fall under that, must submit to that authority. Because if they are doing it by the word of God, now, they, they might not always do it by the word of God. And if they aren't doing it by the word of God, remember what we talked about with the magistrate, the same thing. If there's a civil magistrate who is not acting in the word of God, we as believers must stand against that. Same with the ecclesial leadership. If there is an ecclesiastical leader who is not, who is making decisions that are not based on the Bible, then we as true believers must stand against that. But if a decision comes down from higher up, that is consonant with the word, that they can show, you know, they can list a whole bunch of scriptures that are all, that are not taken out of context, but are used properly and used within the scriptures with the way the Bible intends, then we must submit to that. If not, then we are in error. And this gets drawn from Matthew chapter 18. So Matthew chapter 18, remember, this is where the section on uh, forgiveness is and the section on uh, church discipline. Well, at the end of that, uh, Jesus says this to Peter specifically, or I think it's to everyone. Truly, I say to you, to the disciples, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they, they may ask, it shall be done for them by my father who is in heaven. For, there, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Now, everybody loves that verse. We always talk about that verse in, in worship, you know, especially when you only have like two or three people in worship or in, at, a, at a prayer meeting. Well, Jesus is here because there's at least two of us. That verse is actually taken out of context when you're using it that way. The context of that passage is within the structure of church discipline and within the structure of the church hierarchy. When... Again, that's what he says here. Jesus says, whatever you have, whatever you bind on earth. So Jesus is giving the disciples the apostolic power to essentially bind what we, you know, if we bind what we say here or we loose what we say here, then, then so be it. Again, if it's according to the word of God, then that's the way it is. If it's not according to the word of God, if a decision comes down that is, con or that is dissonant with God's word, then that is an error. They have the error and should be repudiated, rebuked, and repented from. But if what's coming down from the higher-ups, from the hierarchy, from the apostles, from the other, you know, other ministers, and it's consonant with God's word, then they are essentially loosing or binding the conscience. And again, what you know, Jesus says, again, I say to you that if two, or, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. The context there is talking about forgiveness. And talking about church discipline. Don't pull verse 19 out to make it sound like you can prosperity gospel your way to, to riches. That is not what Jesus is talking about. Oh, well, just pray hard enough and God will give you that $10,000 or whatever. You know, take, go, go with your brother and, you know, the two of you pray. Jesus says it right there and you'll, you'll get it. That's taking this verse out of context. The context of this verse is church discipline. What we've been talking about for the last chap this chapter and last chapter. And so when the assembly, when two or three agree 
on the God's word and the teaching and the administration of that word, that then, you know, it'll be done with you. It'll be done for you by, have, by my father in heaven. So that's the, that's that question there. Let me, I'm going to blow, breeze through the next two articles and then I'll entertain any questions. Article four says, um, or excuse me, article, yeah, article four. All synods or councils since the apostles' times, whether general or particular, may err, and many have erred. Therefore, they are not to be made the rule of faith or practice, but to be used as a help in both. So notice here that the Westminster Divines recognize that synods and councils, they have erred. Many of, they may err, and many of them have erred. They've, they've made error in their interpretation. They've made error in their application. And that's why these councils are not to be made the rule of faith, they say, but to be used as a help. Which is why, you know, you can look at something like, you know, for instance, the, the Chalcedonian definition. The, the uh, Council of Chalcedon met, I think, in the, maybe the 400s. I can't quite remember. They put down a definition of, of Christology. Who, who is Christ? What, what, is he, what, what does he look like? Well, he's this and he's not that. He's this. And it goes through. It's a, it's, a, it's a definition. It's very straightforward. But it helps us to understand who Jesus is. They didn't err. I don't think they erred. But it helps us to understand because that's not the Bible. If they did err, we could still use it, that conversation, but say, all right, this is where it's based in Scripture. That is what we have to, to, to follow through on. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 19, the apostle says, Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all, they all are not of us. So there, there, there the Apostle John recognizes that the count, you know, we, the church, people in the church can turn against, they can be controversial in that sense of the word, and they can turn. They can have error. Same with, not only can individuals do that, but councils and synods can as well. And so they are not to be made the rule of faith, but be used as a help. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, Paul says, And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Notice there what Paul is saying. It's not, our faith is not based on the, the wisdom of men. These assemblies, these gatherings, they can be wise or they can be unwise. Thanks be to God, our faith is not based on human wisdom, but based on the power of God. And the last article here, Article 5. Synods and councils are to handle or conclude nothing but that which is ecclesiastical and are not to intermeddle with civil affairs which, certain, which concern the commonwealth unless by way of humble petition in cases extraordinary or by way of advice for satisfaction of conscience, if they be thereunto required by the civil magistrate. So again, remember that this, the, I drew up there the two realms, the ecclesiastical realm, the church realm, and the civil realm, the magistrate's realm. They're, they're just repeating here what's going on here. The, the limits of these councils is to be within the, world, the ecclesiastical world. Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 14. Someone in the crowd says to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. So that's what this person, they come up to Jesus, they're squabbling with their brother. Jesus, tell him to, to you know, it, split his inheritance equally with me. What does Jesus say to him? Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? Then he goes on and gives a nice little parable. But here Jesus makes this point that his role, and I would dare say the church's role, is not to settle in these in these uh, uh, civil disputes, these civil matters. If someone has an estate and their children are debating over it, well, the church needs to stay out of that conversation <laughs> because the church has no place in it. Even if one of the you know, inheritors wants to give it to the church, nope, the church needs to stay out of it because that is not your responsibility, our responsibility as a church. Let them figure that out in the civil courts, in the law courts. Let them duke it out and figure out their inheritance over there. So that's just one example. And again, we're not to meddle in, in civil affairs, except in cases extraordinary. Um, too often I see this today. 
our denomination, the Southern Baptist Church, there are many other denominations. We have what are what we call public witness offices. In, that, in, case, in our case, it's the Office of Public Witness, I think is what we call it. Uh, the Southern Baptist has the Ethics and Liberty Commission, no, Religious Ethics, R-E-L-R-C. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's and, so bad. And, and so, you know, you know, here we have two different forms of government, and there are many others, all, I would say all other denominations, have these committees, these whatever, that are in D.C. Why? So they, they're essentially lobbyists. That's what these, these folks are, they're acting as lobbyists. What does the Westminster Confession says? Not to meddle with civil affairs, except in cases extraordinary. So for instance, you know, in our case, if President Biden wanted the church's opinion on something, well, he has all right to come up to a, a church leader and say, hey, give me your opinion on this thing. But we as citizens, you know, we as the church don't need to be meddling with the civil affairs. Now, you know, we as Americans might be concerned that there could be a war going on in Ukraine, and we as Americans certainly need to, you know, voice about that. But the church has no, unless he, you know, unless the president asks, the church has no opinion, so to speak, on whether or not America should go to war, or whether or not these things should, you know, whatever sanctions we might place as a nation on other people. John 18, verse 36, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. So Jesus is talking to, um, uh, I think he's talking to Pilate. Jesus, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. So notice Jesus even said, and he said somewhere else, that he, he could have hosts of angels uh, at, at a, in a, a flashing moment, come down and, and do all the things that would you know, save him from the Romans or whatever. But he doesn't. He doesn't meddle with those affairs. Jesus has a mission, the church has a mission, and we don't meddle in the civil affairs unless we've been invited to. So the Westminster Divines, in this case, have been invited to, because you would think that they're, they're, they're breaking their own article here. Well, they're not. The prime minister in, called this assembly. Now, to be fair and to be transparent, the prime minister at this time is a nonconformist and a pro-Westminster assembly person. So. In, it, you know, there could be some gray area there, but it wasn't the church that, that called this assembly. It was the prime minister. The, the, the political entity called this meeting to assemble. And so they are, on behalf of the prime minister, making this document to aid and not to meddle with the civil affairs. Now, of course, again, we see that that doesn't happen. Um, and, and so, yeah, by way of advice, of satisfaction of conscience, if required. Again, that's, that's there. Any, that's the end of that. Any questions on, on anything? I know we're over time. That was a lot. I'll try to squeeze in there. Okay, well, let me close with a word of prayer. Holy God, first of all, I do want to thank you so much for giving to us a, a biblical model of our structure within, within the church. And Lord, I know we may call it by different names, and I know that at times we've, uh, we've allowed it to err. God, I pray for your forgiveness, and I pray for your grace there. But Lord, I also pray that as we look across our structures, as we look across church history, and where our councils, where our synods, where our leadership has not erred, where they have stood firm with the, with the gospel, where they've stood with scripture, may we submit to that. May we trust in them. May we come to rely on their wisdom, because there is wisdom when there is a, a, a council of counselors. And Lord, we also know that the only final and full rule of faith is your word. And so God, I pray that you help us, whatever type of assembly we're in, if there is someone above us who is in error, may we stand on God's word and may we call them to repentance. And Lord, I pray all this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.